In 1945, in 1945, George Orwell introduced the world to a book called Animal Farm. It's a story about a group of animals who led a revolt in their farm against their human farmer owner. And they desired to set up a more perfect society where animals on the farm could be equal and free and happy. However, along the way, uh, the ideals were betrayed and the conditions ended up worse than they were before under the dictatorship and vocal leader who was the domineering force behind this, a pig named Napoleon, who ended up working with the humans and the story ends where the pigs are in the house with the humans and as they peered through the window, they couldn't tell the difference between pigs and humans. When the rebellion began, one of the most important tenets of belief among the animals was that all animals are equal. But along the way, as power was consolidated among certain animals, particularly the pigs, the phrase changed to all animals are equal, but some are more equal than others. In this statement, Orwell made a central point through the use of paradox, a statement of truth that did not seem to make logical sense. The reader was left to interpret what was meant by that point, but it was clear that Orwell was making a, a certain point that governments in the 1940s were claiming everyone was equal when clearly that was false. Certain forms of government around the, that time championed the cause of equality only to be ruled by a few, where only a particular class gained wealth and ease on the backs of everyone else. I'm glad that only happened in the 1940s. <laughs> Paradox. Paradox is a useful tool in teaching and in literature. But actually, it's a useful tool, but sometimes it can be frustrating. Paradox can be frustrating. It makes two seemingly absurd or contradictory statements that when investigated or explained will prove to be true or well-founded. Here are some examples of paradox. Uh, this is the uh, mission statement of Costco, I believe. Save money by spending it. Uh, you can save money by spending money. Look how much money I saved by spending all this money. Or, if I know one thing, it's that I know nothing. Or, this is the beginning of the end. Or, deep down, you're really shallow. Some of you heard those on dates, uh, your last date that you were on. George Bernard Shaw said, what a pity that youth must be wasted on the young. And Oscar Wilde said, I can resist anything but temptation. Two weeks ago, uh, we looked at a biblical paradox, and I would say even maybe the biblical paradox that is both helpful because God's given it to us and sometimes frustrating because it seems like we can't make sense of these two realities, that God is sovereign and in control of all things, including our salvation, and yet mankind is responsible for our actions and our responses. Those two Things are both biblically true, and yet they, they don't seem like they blend together and seem like they can work together. Paul wrote to the book of, uh, in the book of Ephesians to the people at Ephesus, the church at Ephesus, to encourage them. And we talked about it two weeks ago when he talked about God's choosing us, he's predestining us. He, he meant it as a, as a settled reality, we have a settled reality and position with Christ. The goal, he said, of salvation ultimately was our holiness and blamelessness. That, that one day, what Christ is doing for us today is that he's creating a people for himself into eternity that is holy and blameless. That's our job every day, right? Is, is to become more like Christ as he prepares us for an eternity with him. The, the salvation, or this salvation, was a result of God playing out the pleasure of his will to choose for himself, by himself, and to himself 
a group of people who would inherit a sure standing and future with him. He talked about it in terms of adopting us as children. And so all of this was God's plan played out that he would choose for himself a people that would be with him forever. This was determined before the world began and was put into effect with the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, this wasn't given as a polemic. It wasn't given to argue a point. It wasn't because there was false teaching in the church. It was purely positive. It was, it was supposed to encourage the church to remind us all that we are, that we are beloved by our Savior, that you are loved without a doubt by our Lord Jesus Christ, that we are resourced as a church and we are secure, which should give us confidence. It should embolden us in worship and grant us rest. So that's where we were two weeks ago. And I, I told you two weeks ago that I wanted to dig in and answer some of the questions that we'd have from there. So when we speak of something like biblical paradox, two seemingly uh, uh, incongruent statements, we're not saying that the Bible is obscure or that these paradoxes, paradox, what's the plural of paradox? Paradoxine? Look it up. Somebody Google it for me. The, the, the point of paradox is not obscurity or lack of clarity. In other words, it's very important. God gives us these things for us to know. So what we're saying, what we are saying is that there are certain truths that are difficult for us to get our minds around because we are by nature finite and fallible, living in a fallen world with minds corrupted by sin. In other words, in my humanness, I cannot understand all the things of God. I just, I can't get there. Now, but I've also, we have to recognize that from from infancy, we've been conditioned to think that we are the highest form of thinking or that what we think is the most important thing. I mean, that's been bombarded from commercials and advertising to things we've seen around us through our education. We've been taught to think of self outward. We start with self and we move outward to draw logical conclusions, to trust our own thinking, and to reject things that we may not understand. How easy is it for us? Things that we don't understand, we're like, eh, I'm just gonna, I'm not gonna think about it anymore. I don't need to know that. I don't care about it. And we push it to the side. But we also understand that God's ways, listen, God's ways are greater than our own his thoughts are beyond our thoughts, and that he does not have to prove himself to us. He doesn't have to prove it to us to say, God, until you make it understandable for me, until you prove it to me in my court, then, then I'm not going to accept it and I'm not going to believe it. He doesn't have to run anything by us. Here's how scripture describes God to us, right? This is a good thing. I'm telling you, this is great. Deuteronomy 29, 29. If you don't have Deuteronomy 29, 29 as a reference point in your mind, at least memorize that reference. Circle it, underline it in your Bible. It says this, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever that we may know, that we may do all the words of this law. There are certain secrets that God lets us in on, and there are certain secrets that he keeps from us, right? In other words, there are certain things that he goes, you can have this, I want you to understand this, but you're not ready or not able to comprehend these other things, and that's ultimately, like I said, a good thing. Second, Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9. For my thoughts, says the Lord, are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. In other words, God thinks, he acts, and works fundamentally differently than us, and we can only comprehend, comprehend what he has revealed to us because that's literally all we can handle. We can't handle more than that. I will tell you, this is great news for us. God 
being distinct from us means he is the one who can answer prayers. He can affect the world. He can redeem the lost. We want to know what God knows. God, let us in on the secret. I can handle it. Give me the information. Tell me why, right? And, it's, and the why question of God is the number one question we ask of God. Why did you do it this way? Why? Why not that way? We want the longing questions of our hearts and minds answered, but the fact is, not only can we not understand them all, if we did, we'd be God, and if we were gods, we'd be puny gods for sure. So, so when we live with the fact that God is transcendent, God is transcendent and other, yes, he's revealed himself, but there is part of him that is still unknowable, it becomes a foundation of trust and faith. Far too often, we don't grapple with that. We, we have King Kong-sized answers or, or questions that we have, and we try to answer them with kind of a Curious George approach. We want to grapple with and wrestle with God's greatness and rest in his greatness and be okay that we can't totally understand. So why is this all important? Why is this important? When it comes to the paradox of salvation, God is sovereign and we are responsible. There is a deep sense of mystery. Deep sense of mystery. No matter how we're going to explain this, no matter what scripture we're going to go through, there's certain parts of this, listen, that we're not going to know, that we're not going to understand. And, and we have to be okay, not only with paradox. I used to have a seminary professor. He says, if you don't like paradox, get a new religion. I was like, okay, I'm out of here, right? Like I... If you don't like religion, but we also embrace this idea of mystery, that not that it's secret, it's, it's not a secret that's not known, it's just only known by God, not revealed to us. And so in those areas of mystery, we have to simply trust in the goodness and the love of God to answer. The simple answer is actually the most profound answer. The simple answer is the answer, is that God knows and he decides. And sometimes we're not okay with that. We want more than that, but sometimes that is the ultimate answer. No one can truly figure out or comprehend the depths of God's wisdom, and there will always be questions we cannot answer. However, what God has given us to know, we seek to understand so that we can know him in the fullness of his revealed self. What we have is enough. He has revealed himself so that we can know him and trust him and rest in him. So we live in this tension of paradox, trusting a God who is involved in the broad things of life and the narrow things, the big and the small, the universal and the intimate, the joyful and the sorrowful in both suffering and salvation. His grace is lavished in all things. So... Here are some questions that I think are the right questions to ask based on what we talked about two weeks ago. If God has elected some before the foundation of the world, if he's predestined people, if he's chosen, how do we, how do we make sense of that? And it spurs on these questions, and maybe you have more than these, but I don't think you have less than these. Here are some questions that we naturally ask. First is this, in some shape or form, maybe you'll phrase them differently. If God chooses us for salvation, what does that do to our free will? Are we simply robots? Is God simply manipulating us? Are we just robotic? If God already chooses and predetermines everything, then, then do we even have a role in this? Are we just robotic and he's just, you know, moving all the pieces along the board and we have no say in the matter? That's, anybody ask that question at some level? Okay, I have. Maybe I'm the only one. Maybe this is just a sermon for me. What about, what about all the, all passages of scripture or that God loves the entire world that talks, that scripture talks about where the call is to ever, to whoever would believe can be saved, not just to the elect. What do we do with that? How do we reconcile that? It's a great question. Third, if God chooses for salvation, what does that do to our responsibility? Is it then my fault for unbelief? And then where does faith come in? Fair question. 
Lastly, if God chooses beforehand, doesn't that diminish the need or motivation for evangelism? Those are all questions, I think, first off, that are really good questions, not just because I wrote them. Okay, I, I, they're good questions regardless. If you've ever read the Bible or thought about these doctrines, these questions or some form of them have crossed your mind, especially those of us who, if you grapple with God's sovereignty and salvation, you've asked the question, God, why would you not save my loved one? Why did you save some of my kids and not all of my kids? Why would you not save my uncle, my aunt, my neighbor when you could? Anybody ever grapple with that question? Second, we will do our best here to not proof text. Uh, I'm not going to just throw a bunch of verses at you. We're going to look at two chapters in like 20 minutes. We're going to take a look at two chapters, meaning uh, that we're not just going to come up with a conclusion and say, well, let's find all the verses that support that conclusion. That's a dangerous way to study. So we're, we must wrestle with God's sovereign choice because that's what the Bible says and with the fact that he loved all the world and desires all people to be saved, according to 1 Timothy 2, verse 4. We cannot simply say, I just don't believe in election and predestination. You can't say that because the Bible says it. So we have to approach it differently because that would be disbelieving a clear biblical word and teaching. We must try to keep the whole counsel of Scripture in play. By the way, time out. This is glorious, right? Like, here, here's, what I'm, here's what I want to try to impress upon you. Anything that we say up in the, in the pulpit, anything we have as a church, if we can't back it up biblically, you shouldn't believe it. Is that right? Like, you shouldn't buy it. You shouldn't go with it. That means, that means all of you have access to the same information I do. I study my Bible, you study your Bible, and you're like, well, what about this verse? Well, what about this verse? I'm like, good question. What about that verse? Let's wrestle with it together. Today is, is, what day is today? October 31st, 31st? October 31st is what day? Reformation Day. Thank you for not saying trunk or treat day, but Reformation Day. Remember in the Reformation that we remember what Luther did in, in uh, nailing the thesis, thesis to, the, to the door of Wittenberg, but there's another man around this time in 1525 by the name of William Tyndale. William Tyndale in 1536 was strangled and burned at the stake. Do you know why he was burned at the stake? Do you know why William, do you know the audacity that William Tyndale had and what he did that would make the government and the church so upset that they killed him with strangulation and fire? Ready? He put the Bible in English. He put the Bible from Latin to English so that the common man, that the person, the young kid on the, had, behind the plow could understand the word of God even more than the priest who only spoke, only studied in Latin. We have God's word. Folks, you have God's word accessible to you. And so we study these things. One of the best things I heard after two weeks ago, after two weeks ago sermon, was not just that people agreed or disagreed, it was people on both sides going, you know what, I need to study this more. I'm like, mission accomplished. Like, let's study these things together. Let's study this out and see what scripture says and wrestle with things like mystery and paradox. And you'll, you'll show me this verse, I go, oh, that's a tough one, what about this? Ooh, that's a tough one. But they all go together because God put it together. Third, like many, who have gone before in wrestling through scripture, we will not let disagreement divide us. We're not gonna let disagreement over these things divide us. When we, when we invite new people into our church through first step or through membership, what, what do we, what do we, what's one of our values? We believe in what? That God is totally and absolutely what? Sovereign. He's sovereign. Now, I believe that in very broad and general ways and in very specific ways, but, but if we can agree that he is sovereign, we can work out these other things even if we disagree with some of the, the things under that. John Piper wrote a 700-page tome 
to try to answer one question about God's sovereignty and salvation. And after that, it wasn't that everyone agreed with him. It's okay if we disagree on some of these things. I believe we will come to further and further agreement the, the longer we're together and the more we're committed to Scripture. Scripture actually unites us. Doctrine should unite us, not divide us. And fourth, and maybe most importantly, we want to rest and trust and stand and double down on the sovereignty of God. When we face job loss because of an overreaching government, anyone facing that right now? We trust the sovereignty of God. When we lose a mother and a friend, or we move into the unknown of moving to a church plant, we double down on the fact that God is an all-consuming fire. He is glorious, without equal, for from him and through him and to him are all things, and to him be the glory forever and ever, amen. We're gonna trust the sovereignty of God. I'm gonna trust myself less, and I'm gonna trust God's sovereignty more. That is not natural, that is not normal, that is not the majority, that is a very minority belief and less practiced in our time. So, in like 18 minutes, we're gonna survey Romans 9 and 10, unprecedented in the history of this pulpit which I believe will answer some, if not all, of the questions that were posed. The first eight chapters, you'll remember the first eight chapters of the book of Romans is an overview of the gospel itself. The theme verse, one of the theme verses of Romans, chapter one, verses 16 to 17, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. From there, Romans 1, 18 to chapter 3, verse 20, declares that the whole world, it doesn't matter who you are, your upbringing, you are guilty of your sin and, des- and worthy of punishment. Chapter 3, verse 21 to 521, we see that God's God's, God provides righteousness and justifies sinners in Jesus. And then chapter 5, verse 21 to the end of 8 is about sanctification as a demonstration of God's righteousness. We come to chapter 9, and I, what I believe is Paul gives an application or even an illustration of how that gospel plays out, particularly with the nation of Israel. And what we're going to see, if you write in your margins of your Bible, do you know what all of chapter 9, Romans 9 is about? God's sovereignty in salvation. Chapter 10 is all about man's responsibility in salvation. In two chapters, he covers both of these on both ends. So I want to give you five quick points as we, and we're going to, we're not going to read every verse. I want to read some key verses, but I want to try to answer these questions. And in the end, embolden our heart to trust him more. So the first is this. Look back at chapter 9, verses 1 to 5. You'll see that Paul's heart for the lost Jews, the lost countrymen of his his own countrymen, is displayed. Look at verse 3. Look at 9, verse 3. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ For the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Look at chapter 10, verse 1. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. Paul had an unparalleled passion for the gospel, did he not? Once he was saved on the Damascus Road, it was his his life's, not just call and the command given to him, but his life's passion to see the lost people come to know Christ. And, and he was the largest conduit of that to the Gentile world, but his heart's passion also was for his own countrymen, the Jews. If you'll notice in verses 4 and 5 here, he knew that the Jews were God's chosen people. They had every privilege. Think about this. The Jews were given every privilege by God that he could give humanity. They experienced adoption, glory, covenants, the law, 
temple worship, and promises, which culminated in the birth of Messiah, Jesus Christ. Israel was supposed to be a light to the nations. Israel was supposed to be God's chosen instrument by which he would demonstrate his goodness and the salvation he could bring to everyone around, but we know they failed. So Paul had tension. You'll notice this tension in the first three verses. It says in verse two that he had unceasing anguish and great sorrow in his heart. Despite all these promises, Israel had rejected their Messiah and ultimately their God. And how did Paul know that? Because Paul was the poster child for that rejection. Paul knew intimately as a Pharisee of Pharisees, as one who studied the law, as a teacher of the law, that he was that guy, that he actually knew all the law and he had rejected the God of the law by thinking his own righteousness could get to him. But he also knew He also knew the power of the transforming work of the gospel that he could take, God can take someone on route to destroy the church to make a man who is willing to die for the church. Somebody who is willing to lock lock people up for the sake of the gospel that he was willing to be in prison for the gospel. So here's Paul saying, I get it. My eyes were opened and I even want, I'm willing to exchange myself like, make me a curse, God, if that means you could save, make me the one who, who substitutes and sacrifices himself for the sake of my countrymen. Because his tension was, they're God's chosen people, but not all of them are saved. So then he begs this next question. Look at chapter 9, verse 6. God's free and divine choice is explained. But it is not as though the word of God has failed, And it's begging the question, for not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. In other words, Paul is begging this question, why not, God? Why didn't you save all of Israel to be your adopted kids into eternity? It seems like you say you chose them, but not all of them are actually saved. And here is the, has your promise failed? And here is the tough answer that he gives God never intended for all of Israel to be saved. God had ordained that some were children of faith, or sorry, sorry, children of promise, Israel by faith, and some were children of flesh, Israel by birth. He then explained how the promise came through a certain segment of the people out of Abraham. It came through Isaac and Rebekah, Jacob and Esau, or Jacob, not Esau. Look at verses 11 to 13. Man, I'm telling you, if you have not underlined Romans 9, 11 to 13, you should. Though, this is now Jacob and Esau, though they were not yet born and had done nothing, either good or bad. This is Jacob and Esau in utero, uh, twins, had done nothing, had not been able to sin or do anything in obedience in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls, she was told the older will serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob have I loved, and Esau have I hated. This was the Baker Boys family verse, as I quoted to my older brother quite often. (laughs) The older or the younger, the older will, be ser- will serve the younger. That's what I told him all the time. And then he hit me. Anyway, <laughs> God chose the people of promise and the means of promise. He chose to extend the promise through Jacob. Listen, not because Jacob was better, not because Jacob was going to be more obedient. And we know the life of Jacob. Was Jacob this upstanding, fine, obedient, faithful guy? Kind of a worm. Kind of a weasel in some ways. And yet God chose uh, his promise through Jacob. Why? Not because Esau was wicked, not because he was hairy, but because God chose to. And that is the answer that Paul is giving and really the answer to most of our questions. God could have left it there. He could have said, I chose to do it. But he goes on to further explain, and this is what I love, anticipating our questions. So now look at the anticipated questions answered. Look at chapter 9, verse 14. 
I love this. The reason why I am, we embrace the questions you might have about this is because the Bible anticipates them. Paul anticipated them. He's going, I'm going to say this, and I know what you're thinking already, and let me, just, let me just head you off. Here's what you're thinking, and it's fair and fine to think this way, and here's what it says at 914. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? The question really is this. It doesn't seem fair that God would choose one over the other, especially since it wasn't based on actions or works. This verse is challenging for us because it says, Jacob I love, Esau I have I what? Hated from, from the time in the womb. That doesn't seem fair. Doesn't seem fair. Stinks for Esau. That's why no one names their kid Esau, let's be honest. Unless you did. And here is the answer. Look at the answer given in verse 15. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then, listen, it does not depend on human will or exertion, or the other word is effort. It doesn't matter about human effort or your will. It doesn't matter on your response. It doesn't matter on how hard you try. It doesn't matter what you, what you desire to do. It doesn't matter on those things, but on God who has mercy. And he goes on to describe how in the Old Testament that God chose to harden Pharaoh's heart when Israel was coming out of, the, out of Egypt into the promised land. And God says in Exodus 14.4, I think 14.4, I'm going I'm to harden Pharaoh's heart after Pharaoh had hardened his heart, but I'm going to harden his heart so that I will get the glory in what's going to happen. God makes free choices based on his goodness and mercy, not based on our responses or our decisions. That leads to question number two. Look at verse 19. 19 says... You will say then, anticipating the next question, why does he still find fault? Who can resist his will? How can man be responsible? Who can resist his hardening or mercy? And here is God's answer. Who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Well, what is molded say to the molder? Why have you made us this way? God is the molder of human life. He is the decider of human life. He creates you the way he wants you to be. That is why, by the way, folks, in all of the things going on and the shenanigans, I don't know a better word, shenanigans going on with with people switching their gender to switching uh, their sexual desires, all that's going on, all of that is rebellion against God. All of it is rebellion against their creator for how, they create, how he created them. That's all what it is. It's saying, I don't like how you created me, God, so I'm going to go a different way. But, but here, the answer to the question is, who can resist his will? It's like if you had some Play-Doh, and you form that Play-Doh into a bowl, and the Play-Doh looks back at you and goes, I don't want to be a bowl. I want it to be a knife. Right? It's, it's absurd. It's absurd that a lump of clay in your hand of, of Play-Doh is like shaking its fist. It didn't even have a fist. It's like, it's, it's and going, I want to be different. And God goes, yeah, you're right. I'll be, right? Like, like that's it. Like, I'm just going to, I'm just going to leave you as a lump there on the, on the ground. Like, that's his response. Now, maybe it's not that harsh, but that's the answer. I made you for the purposes by which I made you. I created you the way I created you. And he goes on to say, I created Israel knowing that they would fail and in their failure, the Gentiles, the non-Jews like me can come in. That's a a result. Israel's rejection opened up, that's in chapter nine, verse 23 to 24, the call to the Gentiles. And then look at chapter nine, verse 27. Though the number of sons of Israel be as... uh, the sand, only a remnant of them will be saved. Even though all of Israel was called, only a remnant will be saved. God has saved, and Paul is a poster child for that. God saves some. He still is saving some. And in chapter 11, we find out he will save more, but he doesn't save all. 
he saves those that he's called. Now, what about the issue of responsibility? Here is, here's fascinating. The fourth point is Israel's responsibility of rebellion and unbelief. Look at chapter 9, verses 30 to 32. What shall we say then, that Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it? That is a righteousness that is by faith, but that Israel who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness did not succeed in reaching that law. Look at 932. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as if it were based on works. They have stumbled over the stumbling stone. Look at verse, uh, chapter 10, verse 3. Oh, look at chapter 10, verse 2. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge, for being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. What does that mean? Who is responsible for Israel's demise? The answer, Israel. The people of Israel. God made himself plain and clear to them. He said, you don't have a righteousness of my own. You can't keep the law. When you break the law, you have to come back to me and you have to trust me by faith. And they set up a system saying, we're going to diminish God. We're going to make him in our image because we think we can have a righteousness of our own that can attain to God's righteousness. The same thing happens today. When we do it in our own way, in our own strength, in our own works, trusting that, we think we can get to God on our own. Mankind is responsible for our sin and our rebellion. God holds us responsible for that. The Bible doesn't frame mankind in terms of free will, but neither does it release us from responsibility for our actions. Every one of us is born as a freestanding moral agent, equipped with volition and choice. Before God changes the disposition of our hearts, though, before we're saved, we sin. Listen, we sin because we want to. Simultaneously rejecting God and living for ourselves. Our will is free to do what it wants, but it is still in bondage. We took a look at that uh, two weeks ago. Ephesians 2, 1 through 3, we're dead. So we're in bondage, but inside that bondage, we have access to free will, but our desires are always against God. God and for ourselves. We have choices, but we always choose wrongly or counter to righteousness. So why did God re reject Israel or those who would not be saved? Because they pursued God in their own brand and form of righteousness. So they were condemned because they sought salvation in the wrong way. In other words, they were condemned not because they were not chosen, but because they were sinful in their actions. This leads to the fourth or fifth thing, and we'll close with these two. Look at chapter 10, verses 11 to 13. The message of salvation is to all people. The message of salvation is to all people. Look what it says. For, for the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be what? Everyone, this is what we believe, folks. This is why this works together. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Do you believe that? Folks, believe that, please. Everyone today, today if you're here and, and you can hear the word of the Lord, today can be a day of salvation for anyone. What does it require? Trust and faith and belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. That he, that he took your place on the cross and died the death that you deserved so that we could have his righteousness so that God could forgive our sin and make us his children. That now we can live for Christ because we're freed up from our sin and in that righteousness we can now, he is Lord of our life. He is our savior and Lord and we live for him. That is good news to all. Do we go to anyone and say, I don't know if I can share the gospel with you because I don't know if you're elect? The answer is, I don't know those things. That's mystery. What I do know is everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. What does that mean? If you believe today, if you have been transformed from darkness to light, if you've been raised from death to life, do you know what that means today? You're elect. You're chosen. You're loved before the foundation of the world. God wanted it that way. 
That's the, that's the simultaneous paradox of this God's sovereign and man's responsibility. I don't know who's chosen. Uh, all I know is anyone who believes, anyone, anyone who would believe, I can understand that they have been chosen before the foundation of the world. And what about, what about the privilege of bringing the message of the gospel? Look at chapter 10, verse 17. So faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. How beautiful, look at verse 15, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. What a privilege, what a beautiful thing that God has created instruments to bring the gospel to a world that goes on to say, look what it says in verse 20, I have, I have been found by those who did not seek me, I have shown myself to those who did not ask for me. We have a gospel that goes beyond what makes common sense to people. We don't have to convince people, what we have to do is present the gospel, and the gospel has transformative power in people's life that even like Paul, who was there to wipe out the church, was transformed immediately by the gospel. It gives us hope that the gospel is what transforms life, lives, and they're not transferred to anything else except a relationship with Christ. Evangelism is vital in this doctrine. Even in the book of Ephesians, Ephesians 1, Paul says, God chose before the foundation of the world. At the end of chapter 6, he says, pray for me that there be an opening to present the gospel to people. I believe this doctrine emboldens us, enlivens us, gives us confidence to share the gospel with dead people. I believe it's God's sovereignty that gets us through the sorrow of the death of a loved one. It's God's sovereignty in my salvation that allows me to put my head on my pillow at night and have assurance of my salvation. Not because I'm good, not because I've done, I had a good day, not because I was faithful that day, but because God is faithful in Jesus Christ to save those that he's called. That's what we celebrate when we come to the communion table. Today, if you are saved, today, if you believe that Jesus died in your place, today, if you have asked for forgiveness of your sins and you're following Jesus Christ, if today you have his righteousness, we come we come in a celebrating way to these tables. And we remember Jesus Christ. We remember salvation is a product of his work on our behalf, that our security is in him, and that he's called us to be holy and blameless. All that comes together in communion. That's why we confess our sin. That's why we say if there's something that's been between us and another person, that means that I'm going to confess my sin now because I can. I want to be pure and blameless. I want, to, I want to anticipate Christ's return because he is the object of my salvation. I didn't come to Christ because of what I get. Actually, the one thing I get in salvation is him. And so I remember that at communion. And lastly, we remember God's absolute sovereignty in all things so that we can sorrow through hard things and rejoice. We can sorrow that we still have loved ones that don't know Christ, but in some way God saw fit to open our eyes and so we rejoice. Let's worship now. We're gonna take communion together. You'll notice that there's tables on the outside of, of the room. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, we ask that you could participate. If you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, we would just ask that you let this time pass. This is for the household of faith, those who have come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Then we're gonna sing at the end. So we're gonna end in this way of celebration and remember our Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, thanks for this morning. Thank you for passages of scripture that help explain hard things. And we live in this tension of paradox. And it's only a tension because of our perspective. Yes, we have to make choices. Yes, we believe. But as we look on the other side of eternity or the other side of the doorway, we see that we were chosen before the foundation of the world. And we rejoice in both realities. We rejoice in both things. And so now, Lord, I pray that we would remember Jesus Christ, that we would savor him, that we'd remember that it's his death, his blood shed for us that saved us.
that his replacement of us, his substitute for us on the cross brought us to the Father. So thank you for his faithfulness in light of our unfaithfulness. And we celebrate this now. We love you and we thank you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.